I'll give you, give you a second example. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, we have the only story of Jesus as a boy in the New Testament. Uh, Jesus is a 12-year-old, and we're told that he and his family have taken a trip to Jerusalem to celebrate a festival, probably the Passover festival. Uh, this, it is a peculiar story because the, uh, the, they, they celebrate this festival, and then the family gets back, goes back in the caravan back home, and three days later they realize Jesus isn't with them. <laughs> I mean, you, you might think they would have checked ahead of time, but they, he's not there, and so they go back to Jerusalem to try and find him, and on the third day, his mother finds him in the temple. And this isn't an accident, by the way, that it's on the third day, right? This is, this is a foreshadowing for Luke of what's going to happen at the resurrection narrative, where on the third day, Jesus will rise from the dead. Well, so on the third day, his mother finds him in the temple, uh, and there's 12-year-old Jesus talking to the leaders of, of the, the Jews and discussing with them matters of the law, and Mary uh, is not pleased, and she sees Jesus finally after tracking him down for three days, and she says, Son, why have you done this? Your father and I have been looking all over for you. Now, when scribes copied this, they, they were taken aback. Your father and I? But Joseph wasn't his father, right? Jesus was born of a virgin. So it doesn't make sense for Mary to say, your father and I have been looking all over for you. And so there are changes in the manuscripts. Some manuscripts simply say, Joseph and I have been looking all over for you. Some manuscripts say, we have been looking all over for you. But somebody's changing the, man changing the text because it could be read as a problem. And so they got, they got rid of the problem. I'll give you a third example. Uh, this example uh, is in one of Jesus' uh, discourses in the New Testament in uh, Matthew chapter 24, in which Jesus is talking about what's going to happen at the end of time. Uh, <laughs> this passage actually was very important. I'm, I, I, feel, I feel a tangent coming on here, by the way. <laughs> this passage was very important uh, when I moved to uh, Chapel Hill in 1988. Uh, this, Bob, you had been gone for a year at this time. In 1988, there was a big furor in North Carolina. Uh, there, were, there, was a, there were Christian groups who thought that the end of the world was going to happen in 1988. Uh, that Jesus was going to come back and take everybody out of the world who, had, who were his followers. Uh, that's the rapture, right? When everybody, the rapture and Jesus comes back, takes people out of the world, and then the, all hell breaks out on earth for seven years, and then the end comes, right? So, so there was a guy who had written a book based on this passage I'm going to talk about in a second. A guy had written this book uh, that was called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Occur in 1988. This, this book was in two million copies. I had students whose parents believed it and literally sold the farm. They, they thought that, that Jesus was going to come back in 1988. And so I just showed up in North Carolina kind of blissfully ignorant of these things. And, uh, uh, you know, I moved from New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> where such things we're not worried about. And we... Um, uh, but this guy, this guy named Edgar Weissenet, he, he, was a, he was a NASA engineer who uh, had, had studied the Bible and come up with 88 reasons why the rapture is going to occur in 1988. And one of the reasons involves this passage I'm going to talk about. Je Jesus tells this passage, the, the disciples want to know when's the end going to come. And Jesus tells them, learn the parable of the fig tree. When the fig tree puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So too, when these things take place, you know that the end is near. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away before all these things take place. So uh, Edgar Weissen, this is one of Edgar Weissenant's 88 reasons. So the way it works is this. Uh, what is Israel in the Bible? Israel sometimes represented as a fig tree. Well, when the fig tree puts forth its leaves, you know that the end is near. Well, okay, so if, if the fig tree is Israel, when does, when does the fig tree put forth its leaves? Well, the, the fig tree lies dormant over the winter, and then when springtime comes, it comes back to life. When does Israel come back to life? 1948. That's when Israel comes back to life, becomes a nation again. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away before all these things take place. How long is a generation in the Bible? Forty years. 1948 plus 40, bingo, 1988. This was one of the 88 reasons. 
Now, somebody pointed out to Edgar Weiss it, that Jesus in the same passage points out that no one knows the day or the hour when the end will come. Uh, when Weissenden had said that it was going to come during the week of Rosh Hashanah uh, in September. And so they said, but you know, Jesus says no one knows the day or the hour. And Weissenden was completely unfazed. He said, I don't know the day or the hour. I just know the week. All right, so, so th this passage actually throughout Christian history has been, been important because people have always been trying to figure out when the end's going to come. So uh, in this passage, Jesus says, no one knows the day or the hour, not the angels of heaven, nor even the Son, but the Father alone. Okay, Matthew 24, 36. Scribes copying that found it uh, to be a peculiar thing to say, though. Not even the Son knows when the end is going to come, I mean, surely the Son of God is all-knowing. Isn't he omniscient? And so how do scribes deal with the problem? They deal with the problem by getting rid of the phrase. And so in later manuscripts, the phrase, not even the Son, is taken out, so that now Jesus doesn't claim to be ignorant about when the end is going to come. So that's, that strikes me as probably an intentional sort of change. All right, so you get, you get accidental changes and you get intentional changes. I want to talk about some of the big differences that you get in some of our manuscripts just, to, just so you can get an idea of, of, uh, of how significant this problem can be. Probably the uh, most familiar story in the New Testament Gospels is the story of Jesus and the woman taken in adultery. I'm pretty sure this is the best known story of the Gospels because it's in all the Hollywood movies. I mean, if, if you do a movie about Jesus, you've got to have Jesus and the woman taken in adultery. It's so much a requirement that even Mel Gibson, who uh, is the Passion of the Christ, which is about Jesus' last hours, has to get this in, and so he has a flashback showing this, this, this scene of uh, Jesus and the woman taken in adultery. So the way the story works, it's, it's found only in the Gospel of John, chapter 7 and 8. And Jesus is teaching the temple, and the Jewish leaders bring, they drag this woman in front of him, and they say, she's been caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says we're to stone someone like this. What do you say? See, this is setting a trap for Jesus, because if Jesus says, well, yeah, stone her, then he's violating his teachings of love and mercy. But if he says, no, forgive her, then he's breaking the law of Moses. So what's it going to be? Well, uh, Jesus has his way of kind of getting out of these traps, as you know, if you, if you read the New Testament. So what he does in this case is he, he stoops down and he starts writing on the ground. And he looks up and he says, let the one without sin among you be the first to cast a stone at her stoops back down, starts writing again, and one by one, feeling guilt of their own sins, they, they begin to leave until Jesus looks up again and there's no one left. And he says to the woman, is there no one left to condemn you? And she says, no, Lord, no one. Jesus replies, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Um, there is a textual variant in a now lost manuscript, which when um, Jesus, uh, about this, this line about let the one, when he says, let the one without sin among you be the first to cast a stone at her. In this one textual variant, uh, it indicates that a stone comes flying out from the crowd, nails the woman in the head. <laughs> and Jesus says, mom, sometimes you really tick me off. I made that up. <laughs> this, this story, uh, th this beautiful story, this powerful story, uh, which uh, has two terrific lines uh, from Jesus in it, this story was not originally in the Gospel of John. This is a story that was added to the Gospel of John by later scribes. How do I know that? We have a number of early manuscripts of the Gospel of John. This story is not found in any of our early or best manuscripts of the Gospel of John. The Greek authors who wrote commentaries on the Gospel of John over the centuries don't mention this story until the 10th century, a thousand years after the days of Jesus. Uh, the writing style of this story, if you read it in Greek, the writing style is a completely different writing style from the writing style of the rest of the Gospel of John. As a result, scholars have known for years that this story did not originally belong in the Gospel of John. Well, why is it in our English Bibles then? 
Probably what happened was some scribe had heard this story. They'd heard the story and they decided that it illustrated some of the teachings in John chapter 7, and so they, they wrote out the story in a margin. A second scribe came along, saw the story in the margin, and thought it belonged in the text, and then wrote his manuscript by putting the story in the text. Another scribe comes along and copies that manuscript, and that manuscript gets copied, and so on until it becomes part of the textual tradition. And it's these later manuscripts that were used by the translators of the King James Bible in 1611 so that the story came into English uh, through the King James Bible. So um, this story, however, uh, is not a story that was originally in the New Testament. So people sometimes ask me, well, are there any changes that are significant in the New Testament? Yeah, well, this strikes me as a rather significant change that the story of the woman taken in adultery wasn't originally there. 